In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Redeemer, Prince of Peace, He of our brokenness, and hope of the world. Here I am again, <laughs> after one year. <laughs> I remember the time that Lisa and I visited you in this place, and it was, to be honest with you, a little nervous time <laughs> to see new people <laughs> in such a big place with so many of you. Uh, and I have to tell you that the second time is much better. <laughs> Uh, I get to know you a little bit more and more and more familiar faces I encounter with one another. And, and then one of the reasons that we gather together in a place like this for a such a time like this is really to have a good time of fellowship as well as rest and renewal and having a, some time of play and uh, a fun time kind of things. Uh, it's wonderful that we get to know you a little bit more, my part, and you get to know me a little bit more about me and my family, and you know, we, we are friends in Jesus, <laughs> as well as colleagues in ministry. So wonderful that we gather together. Many, many familiar faces, and I saw some of you, I saw you in different places, and, uh, but you are indeed my brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are indeed in this journey together, alive in Christ together on a journey of faith. So thank you for being here. I welcome you, each one of you. Uh, and then one of the good uh, uh, reasons why we need to get together here, for me at least, is to have this kind of opportunity to say thank you more than anything else. I know that it takes a lot to serve as pastor and pastor's spouse and pastor's uh, Parsonage family, uh, the needs of the God's people in so many different ways, and you're constantly, constantly extending yourselves to be responsive, to be with your people, to love them, care for them, and lead them spiritually and otherwise in so many ways. I thank you. You represent the Church of Jesus Christ. You represent the Susquehanna Annual Conference. You represent the United Methodist Church, and you represent this bishop. <laughs> in so many wonderful, awesome ways, and I thank you, thank you, and thank you. I know that our time is really tough for us to serve our church, particularly as leaders of our church, and as pastors, and parsonage family. And uh, recently I uh, shared this with one of small groups gathering of uh, our pastors, uh, but I would like to share this with you one more time. <laughs> it is a very a collection of uh, uh, reflections, uh, very brief reflections uh, of one of our clergy of the United Methodist Church by the name of Kurt uh, Schurman. Uh, and the topics that he lifted up uh, are very revealing, so I just would like to share simply the topics. Okay? Uh, whether you admit or, un admit or not, you have absolutely no idea what's going on. <laughs> Don't take things personally, even if they are meant that way. <laughs> you are no Sigmund Freud, counseled by Rolodex. <laughs> Show up and shut up a ministry strategy for the parish novice. <laughs> Without a people, the vision perishes. Youth are not future of your church, they are the future of somebody else's church. <laughs> How to tell the difference between a member and a customer? Confrontation is an art. <laughs> Embrace this mystery. Sometimes people don't do what's good for them. <laughs> a prophet may be a pain in the neck, but not every pain in the neck is a prophet. <laughs> you really have a pain in your neck, you responded. <laughs> <coughs> Ministers are slowing moving targets. <laughs> the path you have taken is the right one, so why haven't you worked on it? Ministry isn't a hard job, it's simply impossible. 
you are not invincible. Take a break. So here we are to take a break. <laughs> so it's so revealing, isn't it? You know, so I know what it's like to be there with God's people in your place, constantly extending yourself to serve the needs of our people and beyond. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. I just would like to have this moment. Uh, this is uh, not a time for preaching kind of things. Uh, you, you saw how it is worded, time with the bishop. <laughs> it is my time to have that kind of whatever uh, interactions that I would like to have. And it is a very rare opportunity that I have this moment with you. So of course, uh, somewhat personal level, I can be sitting with you for meals and have time of personal conversation or whatever to have a good uh, relationship and fellowship together as God's people, that's wonderful. But in this kind of setting from time to time, maybe a good moment for me to share what's on my heart. <laughs> uh, and some good, exciting things that are happening in the life and ministry of this annual conference or in the United Methodist Church. Well, there may be some challenging issues and agendas that we as leaders of the church need to share one another and see how we can be the church together for such a time as this. So uh, I just would like to say uh, thank you, many of you. I was privileged to visit you and be in your worship and just enjoy the time with God's people there and wonderful. And sometimes I preach and sometimes I just offer words of greetings and thanksgiving kind of things. So it has been a just awesome, awesome journey me and Lisa together for the last year and a half in the midst of God's people called the Subscribe Angel Conference. So when I say I love you, it really comes from the bottom of my heart. I love you. <laughs> I love you. Uh, of course, uh, there would be a time that we can share somewhat a, 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 a critical issue that is of great concern to all of us. But uh, let's not lose the perspective. There are some exciting, good, uh, wonderful things happening all around us. Even as a denomination, uh, probably some of you know about the Image No Malaria campaign. Uh, some years ago when it started, uh, I was somewhat overwhelmed by the goals set up <laughs> for Image No Malaria. It started with nothing but nets but they wanted to expand uh, this uh, the mission program to eradicate. Listen to me. It's not just help people who are having this kind of malaria disease, but trying to eradicate in our lifetime in a way that nobody would die from malaria in our time kind of things. Do you know how much gold they set up? $75 million. <laughs> as a denomination, mostly out of the United States, I thought, wow, that's overwhelming. Can we really do that? But before 2016, it's just 2016 is already, what, two years away from now, almost three years away from now. But this moment, I was told that over $60 million was raised or pledged at this time. $60 million. <laughs> That's who we are, God's people. <laughs> we are doing something significant that can really bring transformation in the world in the name and love and power of Jesus Christ. We are part of that kind of movement for such a time as this. As you may know that our church really would like to plant new churches all over the place. And as a denomination, we set up the goal to starting planting new churches 400 but by this time, I was told that, that we already planted more than 600 churches in the United States. That's who we are. <laughs> and we would like to plant about 600 new churches globally through the mission initiative of General Board of Global Ministries. Our goal was 650 new churches. But now they reported that more than 700 churches were already planted all over the world. 
And Dennis, you told me you're starting a new church <laughs> in another area. In, in the central conferences, 1,900 new congregations were planted. They trained 1,400 potential new congregational planters. In Vietnam, there are now 260 United Methodist churches there. It was a communist country some years ago, right? And they project that there will be 1,000 more United Methodist churches in a decade in Vietnam. That's who we are. It's happening. So thank you for your faithfulness. Our mission connection does make a difference. Big way, huge wave, <laughs> significant way of bringing transformation to this world. As an annual conference, I would like to say thank you. You know, we, in 2012, we did about 3% better than 2011. That's why I asked the shares of ministry <laughs> was concerned. And last year, 2013, we were 2.8% better than 2012. We still have to go some way <laughs> up to the, the, the kind of place that we want to go, but we are moving in the right direction. Amen? Amen? So thank you. I know that it takes a lot for you to make it happen. I even saw one pastor's picture with his beard colored. <laughs> He promised his congregations that if you fulfill whatever, you know, I color my beard, then he did. The church must have paid 100%, I'm sure. <laughs> and we have one pastor who was willing to offer his personal collection of baseball cards to challenge his congregation that this is a covenant that we have to honor. Here it is, and they responded kind of story. Yesterday I was in a church. You may call a church in the rural area. It's not a big church. Not very small church, but you know, kind of church. <laughs> it's a Rundville church. It's Rundville United Methodist Church. Okay, Doug is here with Jen. He's here together. And because I was invited to a very special concert, and it was concert uh, performed by a young man called Jeremy Garner. He is a volunteer youth leader of his congregation. And he had a concert last year because he has a musical talent. He can play some instruments and he has a good voice and he sings gospel music and spiritual songs and shares some messages in between, the kind of things. So he, he makes himself available to different kind of places for testimony and witness. And last year he started with a goal of raising $750, which can be translated into feeding two children for a year in a third world. You know what happened? They raised more than $3,500 last year. Just, just for him doing that with young people and the congregation of the church. And he invited me to this second annual concert with a goal of raising what, 4,200 kind of things to continue to feed at least 10 kids for a year. And last night, they did it. Amen, amen. <laughs> there was such a heartwarming moment. It's not a big church. But the, the sanctuary was, a, was packed. People in the community and other places, ecumenically even, and the congregations in the neighborhood joined together to support this effort of raising funds to feed hungry children with this young man and the youth group in that congregation, working as a team to bring transformation in the lives of some people and then make this world a better place because of their presence with us as God's people. That kind of story. I mean, we already shared some stories here and there, but many, many exciting stories, new things that people are willing to do and offer the opportunities to get in touch with the people in the community who are in need and be in witness on behalf of Jesus Christ as a congregation, a church alive in mission. That's who we are. Thanks be to God for you. 
we'll continue to hear the kind of stories. We'll continue to share the kind of testimonies. And cabinet meeting from time to time, our DSs are sharing just awesome stories and we are all rejoicing to hear the kind of things happening in one of our congregational life and their witness and ministry. And it was exciting to hear that, you know, we have more than 960 some churches in the Susquehanna Annual Conference, but we have more than about 300 congregations are actually growing. Do you know that? 300 congregations are growing among us. Amen. <laughs> we'll continue to find a way to keep our church vital and even get more vital in terms of their growth, not only numerically, but in their spiritual journey and in terms of their outreach ministry and mission in the name of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And Vital Sign Project, I was told that 88% of our churches are registered for that and doing that. It's not for the tool to make any kind of negative judgment or anything like that. It's simply a tool for us to understand where we are and where we would like to head to together as a team. Pastoral leadership and the leaders of the congregation and all God's people in one place have a goal, a worthy goal for God and do something about it the best way we can. That's who we are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, there should be uh, many, many other stories. I'm sure that we have time to share one another in a different way, different time. But I just would like to help you to taste some of it, <laughs> where we are. And we are moving as a church alive together in Christ. And this is time, at the same time, for me to share some of the concerns that that we have. Um, I know that I'm kind of conscious of the time that we have, but as your bishop, as the leaders of our church, when we have this kind of uh, moment, why not share some of the challenge that we face as denomination? And probably as an annual conference, probably as a congregation you may serve now. That is, of course, this uh, homosexuality-related uh, challenge and issue. Continue to bring us a lot of pains, hurts, wounds, brokenness. For some people, despair. Oh. Seems to be it is uh, developing in a fashion that uh, continue to affect more and more in certain way, and one way or another, we are all affected by it directly and indirectly. What is happening in that very very painful issue of our church that we are facing? Uh, even the council of bishops had a very very serious conversation about it and soon we'll hear the statement by the council bishops where we are how to deal with uh, this kind of challenge and we are just neighbor of the Eastern Penn conference we all know what happened there and is in the appeal process and Tom Salzgeber is serving as secretary of the jurisdictional conference so he is in process of helping to make it happen in the right way according to our disciplinary procedures, the kind of things. And then New York Conference, where I saw before, facing a trial, date is set, another trial is to be developed very soon, and then Bishop Webb from our this conference, now serving as Episcopal leader of Upper New York Annual Conference, and probably they will soon will go through that process. Uh, it is happening in the Western jurisdiction. One conference, a TS, performed same gender marriage, and what is going to happen there? Bishop may come out even publicly and make the bishops whatever understanding and intention what to do about it. So here we are. I know that this is uh, not only painful. But I also understand that this is a deeply personal and spiritual issue. So this may not be a good kind of uh, 
setting for us to have a really engagement in conversation. At least we can express that our church is facing a really uh, tremendous challenge in this uh, particular area of, uh, of issue our, our whole society is going through as well as our church. Uh, we, we really need to have a sacred space, a place we can really have trust. So we can open up with honesty and have a time of conversation. Uh, it's a really uh, personal, but at the same time very biblical and theological. Uh, it's very spiritual, but at the same time very practical. Uh, it, it means so much to many different people and affects many different people in different ways. And simply, that's where we are, our church is facing. Nobody knows for sure you know, what is going to happen for the 16th General Conference. But here we are to be called to be a church together, alive in Christ together on a journey of faith. And this annual conference, we are going to lift off the, the second uh, kind of theme for the Quadrennium, which will be alive in Christ together, building up transformational leaders. So transformational leaders <laughs> we are called to be as uh, leaders of our church to bring transformation one way or another. We cannot simply ignore this cannot simply evade this as needed. We have to find a way to help our people, our church, to engage in a conversation in searching for God's future in and through this church. It's not simple. Nobody has all the answers. No one answer would suffice to all people. People are coming all from different places come with a different kind of belief, opinion, conviction. It's an even existential issue for some of the people. That's simply what it is. I do not know whether you are facing kind of uneasy development here and there. Uh, occasionally, some people may come to you and talk about it, and something like that, out of your congregation or even out of your community. People may would like to have some kind of connection with you and to figure it out what it's all about and then even ask you to help them to take this journey as God's people. And even today, I was told that the cover story of the newspaper of Lancaster was about the trial that the Eastern Pennsylvania had. That's simply where it is now. So what, what would you do if something happens in your community and the media in your community would like to come to you as a leader, spiritual leader of your congregation and ask you whatever kind of response to the situation, how would you deal with that, the media, the concern or whatever the community may have, as well as a concern for you, question from your own congregation. So at this time, I would like to ask Jerry uh, Wolgameth, our <laughs> communication director, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have all the answers. <laughs> what to do about it? <laughs> so I asked uh, Jerry, uh, just uh, spend about five minutes with us. And when something l happens in your community, and you, as a spiritual leader and pastoral leader in that place, need to respond one way or another, what would be the right way to be in response to that kind of situation? Thank you, Bishop. Um, first of all, can you understand me okay? We've been uh, working with some problems with microphones, and I think we have this one fixed. Um, it's, it's my privilege to talk to you for a few moments. Um, I have always felt at home with this particular event because my father was a minister in this particular conference for about 27 years. So I have lived in a church parsonage, and I know a little bit about your world. And for that reason, from the depth of my heart, I thank you for your ministry. I understand of some of what you face each day, and as a layperson, I would like to thank you deeply. When the press calls, <laughs> when the press calls, it's not necessarily a bad day. I have lots of stories that I could tell you. 
If I told all of them to you, it would take a couple hours. I have five minutes. Let me assure you that some of the strongest witnesses that we have made as a body of believers has been in the midst of the turmoil created by whatever circumstance. Because you and I get to talk for free <laughs> about what we are about, what we believe. Larry Holden, if you know that name, is General Secretary of United Methodist Communications. Uh, a man with a great mind that uh, he shares at Larry Holden, H-O-L-L-O-N, dot com. He has his own website. Wonderful insight. A number of years ago, he wrote a book, not a number, two years ago, he wrote a book called We Must Speak. Has anybody read it? I wish you would. It's not a big book, but it makes a great point, and that is in our culture, the message that we have been given, we must speak. To say no comment, or we don't want to talk about that, is not enough. God calls us someplace else. There is always something to talk about. When we meet the press, there are certain things that it's not appropriate to talk about. We can talk about that, that we want to do no harm to anyone. We believe in the value of every human being, and for that person, we have a very high responsibility to be responsible in how we reply to the press. The press will accept that. Uh, if, they, <coughs> if they won't, you can say things like, I'm sure, press person, that with your experience, you can understand that persons like me cannot always reveal certain facts until we know the truth. The press wants the truth, we want the truth, and we'll find it together, and we will reveal what is appropriate at the appropriate time. Now, the favorite subject these days when my phone rings from the press is, you know what? Uh, I think it's best to be honest about who we are and what we face as a denomination. We are not of one mind. We have never claimed to be uniform Methodists, am I right? We have claimed to be united Methodists. That's one of the strongest messages that we have to give the world around us. We are united. God has called us to the tension around certain issues. Would you agree? I think God has called us there. Therefore, I think we need to be responsible for that message, that we will work our way through our disagreements and do the best we can as human beings who have our own frailties. We all do best to understand in the best way we can, but we will work our way through being united. Does that make sense? Let me tell you a couple things. One, one thing in particular that I am very grateful to be able to talk about, and that's not directly related to what I just talked about. Often we are in the midst of circumstances that have risen out of misbehavior. Those are embarrassing situations, but we are humans. We make mistakes, okay? But we also believe in transformation, don't we? That's also a part of our loudest message that we can give the culture around us is we are persons of transformation, and we do our best to work out that particular issue with folks. Uh, I'm particularly happy to be able to say to the press, when someone has misbehaved or something inappropriate has happened, we think we have done due diligence. We have trained 4,500 people around the conference. We have a group of 26 persons who train persons about a safe sanctuaries policy. And we think that's the best we as humans can do. And that's been a message that's been pretty well accepted. Now, what happens when the press does call your phone number or arrives at your place? Our policy is that you give me a call. You may have wanted to call me had you been giving some kind of an inkling that there could have been a press interest in some kind of an event that happened at your church. 
I like to know about those. I can prepare myself for the inevitable that there will be a phone call that we'll need to make some kind of a reply to. It also gives me time to pray, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, when a press person needs an answer to a question, you've been asked to send them to me, and I will be glad to respond in the best way I can. Let me say in passing that I am very grateful for the trust that you passed on to me, and I take that very seriously. I hope I never break that trust. But I will do my best to reply to the press. Now, I need, we need to talk. I need to understand initially just the basics, okay? I don't want to know all the facts, every detail, because I want to be able to say to the press, I need some time to work on this for you. I need an hour and a half. And usually an hour and a half is acceptable in the industry. I will get a hold of you on the phone. We will talk about things that we can talk about or not talk about. Uh, and then I will get some more details and we will talk, we will discuss. I like to think that I'm not taking over, I'm, I'm coming alongside you. We will cooperatively wake, um, find our way through this particular situation. So let's talk, let's come up with the talking points. To be real honest with you, if I were a press person, I would not want to talk to me. <laughs> I would want to talk to the pastor. Now it's not unusual for institutions to have spokespersons for the institution. And so this is not all that unusual. But occasionally, it's been appropriate for a pastor to be the one who responds, if you're comfortable with that. Usually the answer is no, <laughs> and I do the talking. But if you're comfortable with that, uh, we'll do some uh, talking about talking points that you might use as you respond, and I'll give you the chance to speak. Some have accepted that. I could tell you a great story, but I don't have a half hour to do that either. Uh, but, but sometimes it's appropriate for you to speak, and, and I'll help you through that. Um, I think God has called us to a great time in history. I know we don't look at, at it that way on a daily basis. These are rather difficult times, but I think it's a great time for us to be the witness that we can be in press kinds of situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. As needed, uh, you can ask me or your district superintendent in terms of very specific procedures that a book of discipline laid out uh, when something happens. Uh, and we, c we want to be helpful as much as we can uh, according to our common covenant that we are called to, to uphold. And then uh, it is my simply a hope and prayer that we would not come to a place that things will be settled, settled through the trial process. I mean, it, is, it, it costs so much in so many ways. Uh, I will do my best uh, that we uh, do not come to that place. But uh, as required, you may come to that place uh, because of the obligation that you have to fulfill uh, because of the covenant that we uh, are called to uphold. But simply, I just would like you to know that, uh, that, that our church would not come to that kind of place over again and again and again and again in different places. Uh, and, and then, hopefully, um, sooner or later, sooner rather than later, uh, we can come to a better understanding of how and where God is leading to uh, our, our future journey together. Uh, now, uh, for me, uh, probably what I would like to ask you uh, is, uh, you know, I have some guidelines here called Christian conferencing, and specifically two uh, guidelines. One is called Holy Conferencing Principles, and the other, the other one is uh, acronym by Eric Law, who is a very well-known uh, teacher of, of uh, multicultural uh, agenda, uh, respect, and how uh, God's people can involve, uh, engage in a conversation uh, in the presence of God uh, by the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that kind of guidelines uh, would be very, very helpful. So I will put it out there, and you can take it with you. And uh, as needed, uh, hopefully you will be able to utilize uh, the, uh, the principles. If I had more time, I would like to go uh, through by uh, these guidelines one by one. 
uh, but probably uh, another time. But, but, but probably I would like to leave to uh, one, one point here. <coughs> Uh, that according to the Eric law, he is uh, uh, the priest of the Episcopal Church. Uh, respect means respect, responsibility for what you say and feel without blaming others. E means empathetic uh, listening. S means sensitive to different communication styles. P means ponder what you hear and feel before you speak. E means examine your own assumptions and perceptions. C, confidentiality when requested or appropriate. And T, uh, he's talking about tolerance ambiguity. And then that was a somewhat uh, intriguing point that I found. So I just would like to uh, share that uh, with you, just briefly. T stands for trust ambiguity because we are not here to debate who is right or wrong. In a multicultural community, there will be inevitably be differences of experience, understanding, and opinion. There will be ambiguity. For example, a different cultural groups might approach a task in ways that are markedly different, yet are totally appropriate to each group's culture and customs. This is the kind of ambiguity that needs to be tolerated so that together we may discover greater truth. The Judeo-Christian tradition provides support for finding greater truth by trusting the ambiguity that comes with diversity. For example, why are there four versions of the story of Jesus in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why not just one? That might make Christian life easier. But the only church leaders decided to keep four different stories of Jesus in the Bible, even with inconsistent information and discrepancies. The different texts challenge us to struggle with this diversity. In that struggle, we might discover that Christ was and is much more than any one story as remembered and recorded by any one community in a specific time and place. Through this struggle with the diversity in the Bible, we have a greater chance to discover who Christ is for us now. If we trust ambiguity, and listen to how God relates differently with different groups and persons, we are more faithful to God, whom we acknowledge as greater than what any one person or community understands. Thus, the quest for deeper understanding and faith calls us to encounter people from whom we differ and who have different experience of God. So, Sometimes we are struggle uh, with this sense of ambiguity. For some people, it's very clear and white, black and white. But some people, they are in the process of journey in ambiguity to figure it out what's the real will of God. That's simply where we are as church. And still we are called to be the one body of Christ kind of story that we are willing to share to the whole world, particularly in light of the observation of the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., the vision of the beloved community, what it's about. New command I give you, love one another. If you love one another by this, all people in the world will know that you are my disciples love one another. What does beloved community where people can truly love one another in a way that they can lift up the unity in the body of Christ in the midst of sometimes very difficult, not agreeable at this moment, <laughs> differences apparently <coughs> They have and they share. So thank you for listening to me. Have this moment. We'll continue to this have conversation one way or another. As your bishop, if you have a good suggestions, bishop, this may be very helpful to me or to our church in this journey. Let me hear you. I'm willing to have a time of conversation with you and be best way I can of help to our church 
move forward in the spirit of the unity of Christ. Amen? Amen. So we are called to come to the table. So when we come to a moment, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, I hope that is the moment that we can recommit ourselves to this covenant of being one body of Christ, no matter what. Amen.